Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Happy, happy February. You guys, we have finally made it through January. And if you're like me and many others I saw on social media, it seemed like January went on for a super long time. We had a full month here at the happy hour. Yes, Beth Moore kicked off the month. And if you have not listened to that show, highly encourage you to make it this week to listen. And congrats, Beth, on her new book being released into the world this week. I went to Rwanda with my son. I traveled to Nashville for some meetings. January was just full and fun. This weekend, actually, I'm heading to Dallas to go to If Gathering. I've had the honor of being a part of If Gathering since the beginning. And this year, I'll be the host backstage, bringing you conversations. If you are hosting an If Local, tell me. I want to know. Send me a message on Instagram. I want to give you a shout out if I can. But mostly, I cannot wait to worship with all the women around the world that are joining us on the live stream and those that are joining us in the room in Dallas. You guys, there's still time for you to join, and I would love for you to connect with the If Gathering and see you via the If Local community. Check my webpage for all the information about how to join. You guys, in today's conversation, I sat down with Esther Fleece to talk about identity, forgiveness, and community in her life. Esther experienced some tragic moments in her home life and lived through a scary and intense circumstance with her biological father stalking her. She shares how lament led her to forgiveness and God's faithfulness has taught her to rename her offenders, letting her live freed from the damaging words and actions of those who would hurt her. Esther boldly declares freedom from her past and a hope for her future because that is what God says is true. Friends, have you gotten your ticket to Happy Hour Live? A lot of you have. We still have tickets available for both nights. And there are still VIP tickets available for both nights as well. The dates are May 15th and May 16th. Go to jamieivy.com slash events to get your tickets today. The guests for the weekend are Latasha Morrison and Shelly Giglio on Friday night. And then on Saturday night, Christy Wright and Jennifer Allwood. Visit jamieivy.com slash events for all of the details. Basically, these nights have been described as the best girls' night you will ever have. Don't go to a concert. Don't go to a cooking class. Guys, come to Happy Hour Live in Austin, Texas. Join us on May 15th or May 16th. All right, friends, here's my conversation with Esther Fleece. Esther, welcome to the Happy Hour. Thank you for having me. What an honor. You're so kind. Um, I'm so glad you're here. And we're going to talk about amazing things I'm most confident about. Um, But tell us about your family. Oh, I, well, I'm newly married. How Um, long? Three years. We just celebrated three years. Congrats. Thank you. Great gift. I I actually never thought I would be married. I was like well into my 30s and I thought, hey, the single thing, I'm all right. You thought because you weren't worthy to be married or you just thought this might not be in the cards? Yeah. Yeah. See, you're getting right into it right away. (laughs) (laughs) There were definitely like healthy reasons. I didn't date a lot just because dating is like super hard. Yeah. Um, but then there was definitely some wounds that I just had a lot of wrong labels, actually, and fears and insecurities that I was pretty guarded. So, yeah, yeah. but gosh, my husband is like the greatest gift that God's given me, really. So I'm, I love him to death. His name's Joel. And then we just had our first child 17 months ago. His name's Asa. And I'm pregnant with our second. Congrats. I can't believe it. Do so, you have a name already? We do, but, but we're, you don't we're tell. Gonna wait. We're going to be were very. That I know. You know, they waited in the Jewish culture to announce the name at the same time that the circumcision was. And it's actually to this day, it's very big in the Jewish culture that like you wait until the baby is born and then the baby is circumcised and dedicated and the name is announced at the same time. Are you Jewish? I'm not, but I'm like, well, it's part of our history. Yeah. So yeah, so we're going to wait, but our, seven first, days? our first guy is Asa. We're not going to wait seven days. Okay. Yeah. But you are going to wait. I don't wait. think you can. I think the hospital would be like, Oh, they're going to circumcise no. that baby <laughs> yeah. the next day. And they're going to be like, give us a name right uh-huh. now. So yeah. yeah. So we, we do have a name, but we're going to wait. Sorry. To be determined. You know it though. Yes. And you know the middle name? Yes. Well, we're going back and forth in the middle name. Whenever I have friends like you, (laughs) (laughs) I'm always like, do you not care about my own emotions? (laughs) I know that this is a process. I actually do. And I care about your opinions, which is why I don't want you to weigh into it. (laughs) I don't mind the name thing. Not finding out the sex. Oh, I don't know how people do that. That My sister did that for both of her kids. And I'm like, 
well, you have you have way less control issues than I do. So good for you. It is a control thing. <laughs> I remember when we were pregnant, uh, people were like, are you going to wait and find out? And my husband said, we were surprised enough when we found out we were pregnant. <laughs> yeah. So we had our surprise. Yes. We're done. Yeah. We're done. So you're going to have kids close together. Yes. Which I told you before we started recording, but I'll tell you again, it's so hard in the beginning and it's so fabulous as they get older. Thank you. I keep hearing that. So thank you for that encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's like, you can't say a right or wrong way, right? Right. I, I have one of my closest friends has four kids, four years apart, each one. So she's basically been mothering her entire life. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um. So there's pros and cons to that. And there's pros and cons to how you and I have yes. done it. So yeah. you will love it so well, much. Well, I appreciate you having me on before the baby comes because I know I will be very sleep deprived. So, so. you release a book in the <laughs> middle of January and then have a baby yes. in the middle of February, baby. which releasing a book people say is like having a baby. Right. Yeah. That's when you just trust God's timing. I mean, I wouldn't have written that, like, but it's just, I guess, God's timing. And to my publisher's credit, they moved the book launch up an entire month because when we found out that we were expecting again, the baby was due like within a couple of days of the original book launch Okay, but date. can you imagine the marketing around if you would have had this book <laughs> and this baby come out and your, your new name? I, You're well, waiting to honestly, announce the new name of your baby and I your know. book. And I'm announcing like I have a new last name because my first book, I talk about the most difficult things in my life. And it ended like, I always say it doesn't have a Tiffany's bow on the end because I love Tiffany's and I love the bow. And my life did not have really a happy ending at the end of the first book. And so I'm even announcing, oh, hey, by the way, that wasn't the end of my story. Yeah. In hopes that people know that their heart isn't the end either. Yeah. So I know. Yeah. So people are going to get to learn all sorts of new things about me, including my husband and babies at that time. It's crazy how fast God can move sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you wait for years and then sometimes it's like, whoa. What do you feel about your kids reading your stuff, especially the vulnerability in both books, but in particular your first book, No More Faking Fine? Mm, that's a really good question. You know, you always want your children to walk in the truth. Like it says in scripture, there's no greater joy than that. So I hope that they make a decision to follow Christ and that He is the Lord of their life. But I hope that they see God's love for me, you know, and what He pulled me out of. And I hope they're proud of me. I, I think I get emotional thinking about that, but I hope they, I hope they're proud of me for hanging in there and you know, letting God pull me out of the darkness and not staying stuck, Yeah, I guess. You know, I've talked to a lot of people about their stories and hard things and I have mine, everybody has theirs, right? Yes. And even asking you about what do you hope your kids think about you, it makes me even think about how as parents, we kind of want, and you can, you've probably even experienced this in the 17 months that you've been a mom, is that we kind of want our kids to to not have to struggle. Sure. Like don't we we don't want our kids to hurt and we don't want them to know that this world is so dark and scary, right? Yeah. And so even asking you that it makes me think about how important it is sometimes for us even to talk with our kids about the hard things. Yeah. So that they can see how awesome God is. Yes. But at the same time we have to weigh that with I love you so much. I don't want you to know this. Right. I mean, could you imagine if we took all of the hard stories out of the Bible, if we took all the pain, the suffering, the sin, the disappointment, the longings, think of all the mothers mm. longing, spiritual moms who are longing to have physical children. What if we removed all of those laments? We would, we'd have a very thin Bible to begin with, but those laments are the things that help me to stay in the faith. Like knowing where people have struggled and knowing where Jacob had to wrestle with God to become Israel. Like knowing those things give me hope that I'm not, my wrestling isn't in vain and God's not gonna leave me in it forever. But yeah, we, we really try to sanitize our Christianity. I've never before thought, what if none of those stories were there? Oh, I mean, it really, the Bible would be like five pages. It I mean, totally it would be like would. genealogy. That, I mean, not no, even that. It would just be Jesus. Even, yeah, just Jesus. Which even Jesus genealogy is, is like, yeah, yeah. whoa. Yeah. You wanted, you wanted them to be included? Right. I mean, oh yeah. And, and yet we struggle with really bringing forth our brokenness, you know, and we get embarrassed about it. But I'm, I'm so glad like King David, I mean, he was a, mess. And I've struggled to relate to King David because he was an adulterer and like my- he made those choices. Exactly. Yeah. I really struggle. I struggle relating with him. And then I'm like, wait a second, his like vulnerability, even in the Psalms is what taught me, like I'm supposed to go to God brokenhearted. Like I'm not supposed to sanitize my prayers before I go to God. So I'm so thankful that the Bible is written the way it is. And 
I want my Christianity to mirror that. And it's just not always going to be the stories that we would necessarily write for our own lives. Which I think too is like Christ followers, like our goal, right, is to like point people to the Lord, right? We wanna give God glory, make them see Him. And when we do that, when we're vulnerable with our brokenness and with our struggles, it almost gives a little bit more credibility I, I think, think so. To, this is what God does. And we've yeah. seen him do it through the pages. He's done it in my life. He can do it in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reality is every single person laments. Like we see movements start because of lament, which lament is an expression of grief. It's a cry of anguish. Every single human being will lament. But for the Christian, we're actually the only faith tradition that says God listens to you when you cry. God's actually attracted to in your brokenness. God bottles the tears that you have. One day, God is going to wipe those tears away. I mean, there's like such hope Mm. for a Christian who laments that the world needs that. But that's what attracts the world to us is when we're like, yeah, we agree it's broken. Yeah, We agree there's pain and there's things that we need to lament. And even the way we treat each other, we need to lament that. Um, but the hope that we have as a Christian is that it's not the end of our story. the end. And it's not in vain that God listens. Even when you say lament, I think that can make people nervous. Oh, sure. I know. It's a little bit, sorry. We need to define it because it's a no, little you bit did of define a churchy it, but word. It, but no, it is. But that's not what I mean. I don't think the churchy word makes it nervous. I think the act of lamenting oh, sure. makes people nervous. Oh, yeah. I mean, we go to church and we sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Like... I actually have a really good friend whose husband um, was in the military. They were both in the military. I write about them in my books and he was killed in action. And so she came back. I actually moved in with her um, just trying to help her live through the death of her husband. And so, and we were in a wonderful church community. I still love this church, but like every worship song was happy. And it was like all about the joy and all about, and I'm like, this is not like, there's nothing wrong with her. She's lamenting the death of her husband. That's actually really healthy. Like if she like swept it under the rug, it would be not healthy. Yeah, no biggie. And so she was in the, the deepest grief of her life and she she couldn't sing. And that's when I was like looking at the book of Psalms, which was actually a song book for the Jewish people. And I was like, we're just missing this mm-hmm. language in the church. Like we're missing, like where are the songs of lament in our worship service? You know, we are to celebrate with those who celebrate, like I'm having a child, like I'm so thankful that people are celebrating this child. But like, I need to also remember the women who are struggling with burying their children, like our mutual friend, Kate. Yeah. I need to remember the people that are not having children. Yeah. Like it's such a um, complex thing, life. Um, but yeah, I think most of us are very uncomfortable with sitting in lament, sitting in brokenness. And the way we treat ourselves in it is inevitably how we're going to treat others. And most of us just rush through it. And we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to deal with it. I think there can be, I was thinking as you're talking, it makes me think of maybe when times I might have struggled with this. Maybe I'm embarrassed. I think I should be over this by now. Mm -hmm. Like this can't be that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I just don't want to admit that I might be weak in this moment. Right. Like surely you can handle this, Jamie. Right. You know? Yeah, the the book of Philippians has I think sixteen different like uh, encouragements to like be joyful always, give thanks always, and so we can like look at those in an isolated instance and think, okay, like even if I'm going through a miscarriage or a divorce or a friendship betrayal, like I'm just supposed to be joyful always. And so we like Christianize things when actually we're missing the context in these passages and that Paul's writing from jail and that Paul lamented and he went through deep grief and Jesus himself was a man of sorrows and familiar with grief. And so we're, yeah, we're uncomfortable with it, but it's deeply biblical to not just like bring our grief and lament to God, but to learn to sit with others and man, that ministry of presence. Oh, it's just so underused, underappreciated, yes. undervalued, and so important. Yes, yeah, I agree. Okay, so I wanna go back a little bit. You wrote your first book, No More Faking Fine. It came out in 2017. You have a book coming out, Your New Name, which it already came out in January. But I wanna go back in your life a little bit. Um, you have experienced great grief, great trauma. Talk to me about how God has used your trauma and your grief to bring you where you are today. So you tell me what you want to tell me, but I want to hear your story a little bit. Yeah. Well, I grew up in the Detroit area. Um, I know that you've been there before. You have many friends up Love in Michigan. Love them. Yes. <laughs> um, and I grew up, you know, on the outside, it looked like a normal family. I had Was a it mom a Christian and dad. family? Yeah. Yes. We would go to church. So like looked great. Like my mom like volunteered with the PTA and- you know, it like everything looked fine. My father had a profitable business. I have a younger brother. 
Um, and it was kind of, it felt overnight as a child, but that's just because whatever your normal is, is your normal. Exactly. So yeah. it just felt like overnight my family was changing, but really there were um, years that my father, he had a mental illness to this day. I don't know what it was. Mm probably several. Yeah. Um, and just as he got older, like he was he was refusing help, refusing So medicine. undiagnosed, not dealing with yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And so then that led to like domestic violence and that led to very unpredictable behavior. And um so just seeing that as a kid was really difficult. My mom became kind of my rock in those years because my dad was so unstable. Um, but then you know their marriage was really crumbling and I found myself in and out of court a lot and I would have to testify. Some of that was my dad would go to jail for something and um, he would call me as a character witness, like just so that he How could see me. How old were you? Eight, nine, 10 years that is old. so much pressure. And then going into middle school. It's ridiculous that we didn't protect children back then. I know That's what now, I was going to say. Is that even... Now there's like groups like CASA yeah. out there oh, where you, can, is be, so good. you yes. can be an advocate mm-hmm. for a child and it's so important yeah. to volunteer in that way. Yeah. But no, at the time it was, you know, I was quarantined in rooms and then I would have to go and testify. And so it was very traumatic. My family was like falling apart. I would remember like my dad's side on one side of the aisle and my mom's side on the other. And I didn't know what I was having to testify about, but I thought, well, either way I go, somebody's going to be mad at me. Yeah, you know, it like doesn't either matter. Either side is going to be yeah. mad at me. So those were really oh. difficult years. My mother ended up getting remarried and then he had an affair just a year into their marriage that I found out about and said something and then he left. You found out. I did. And told your mom. I wanted to be like a little detective. Look at you. I just, you know, I think it was God's gift of discernment to yeah. me at an early age. I didn't know that at the time, but I just, so I said something. I mean, something. but you loved your mom. Of course and I did. So I was like, very hey, protective yeah. over her. I thought that was like doing her a favor. Well, when that divorce happened, she just started hating me, honestly. So I was 13. She kind of put blame on you. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you know, I've had to work through, I mean, we could do several podcasts on how to work through forgiveness. It's not like a one and done instance. You got to like choose forgiveness over and over as different memories come back. And yeah, it was just very difficult. But she really stopped being a mom to me really in my middle school years. And that's when families in my community took me in. I was in a public school setting. I actually think you spoke in Michigan and one of my former high school teachers was there. Mm. I just love that community of people, um, both in and out of the church. They just saw saw the need that I had and they met the need. And I would sleep at different yeah. coaches' houses. I would sleep at friends' homes for months. And then I would sometimes go back to my biological mom because I just, you know, there's some there's a tie there that you You know, it's interesting. I want to keep you to keep hearing your story, but I um there's another girl that I just interviewed, Nona Jones, who was on the show in January, and she um, grew up in such an unstable home as well. And I'm so intrigued. I want you to answer this later, but I'm gonna put it in your head. I'm so intrigued as to how does she and how do you come out on the other side when some people can't come out on the yeah. other side of that? I yeah, I, God. I mean, that's. Yeah. But I don't want to be too Christianese about it. But God, for sure. Yeah. But I hear your story, and I remember hearing hers recently when I interviewed her. Um, and it also made me think, man, how many kids in my kids' school? Yeah, are hurting. Are hurting. Yeah, yeah. We don't have to like go overseas to just. I mean, go to your public school or your Christian school for that matter. And there are kids that are hurting. Yeah. There are families that are falling apart. So these families took me in, and I didn't have to go to foster care. Um, and the, all these families are still in my life to this day. They've made me who I am. So you finished out high school. I did, Living yes. with people who were not related to you. Yes, I did. I actually was awarded different scholarships because I was very, I mean, I was very involved. I loved my school. I played three sports. I was the class president. So I was awarded different scholarships to go to college. And I would just ask a different family to go with me to the different like award banquets. Because it was you. pretty embarrassing to, you know, a parents' night was always really painful. Yeah. They would have parents' night and I dreaded it. And I remember my coach would say, I'll walk, I'll mm. walk with you. It's okay. I just had a, I, I just had a wonderful community that helped me get through really difficult years. And then I just, I was saved. I was a Christian and I just wanted to please God genuinely and cared like God had adopted me and I believed I was his and I wanted to work for him. And so I did, I worked really hard for God and I helped start churches and I worked in ministries and I still to this day love, you know, quote unquote, working for God. But 
um, you know, 20 years after one of those courtroom scenes, my biological father showed back up in my life. And you had not, he had not been a part of your life. Not at all. Since eight, no. whatever. Did yeah. you know where he was, what was happening? I didn't. I had heard through like, I should just say, I really was like cut off from the family. Like, it, it's not like I just lost my mom and dad. It's like I lost everyone. And we see that in scripture where like somebody will be generationally like cut off, like Joseph. He was like sold into slavery and that's it, you know? So I like heard through the grapevine that my father was in Florida, but it was like I, I had no contact yeah. with biological family. I always looked over my shoulder because I did live through, you know, his instability and mm -hmm. and was fearful yeah. of him. But 20 years later, I thought I had like made a name for myself and I was moved on and I bought my own home and I was working for a ministry that supported families around the world. Like I just thought I was using my story to help other families not go through what I went through. And I'm still very passionate about seeing marriages thrive and children be raised in loving homes. Uh, but my father reentered my life just as unstable as when he left. His his mental health had deteriorated over 20 years. How did he contact you? And he showed up at my house in Colorado. I mean, I was actually speaking in California and he showed up. My roommate had answered the door and he was there and he said, I'm here to save Esther. She didn't know. He looked disheveled. I mean, he said, I'm her father. I'm here to save her. So she was scared, obviously. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know his motives. I can't, I don't know anyone's motives, yeah. you know? Um, but I went through three years of very intense stalking. And that's when this language of lament, it was the only thing keeping me in the faith. Cause I, like, I couldn't sing the happy songs in church. I worked for a large marriage and family ministry at the time. And um, most of the people I worked with came from nuclear families. So they just like, didn't have a lot of context. I know we had like over 20,000 resources for families, nothing on domestic violence. So I, I didn't, I just didn't know how to like, how yeah. do I yeah. live through this? Yeah. You know, it's interesting hearing your story and there's a million things you have not told me or anybody probably that are part of your story, but it was those three years of your biological father coming back that really led you to this lament yeah. and stick, kept you in the faith. Uh, but I find it interesting because you had lived through, all, like if your father didn't come back, what happened earlier was traumatic enough. Right. You know, but then you had to kind of re-enter this yeah. and learn new language as an adult. Yes. Yes. It was so hard, Jamie. I, you know, I found myself in counseling because what else do yeah. you do? And um, I felt like it was harder than the initial abuse. The initial abuse That's interesting. and abandonment, like, you know, God gives you the grace as a child, I think, especially to just, you have to make it somehow, you know? So I, I just put it aside and I move forward. Um, but God loves us enough to want to heal those places. And um, so going through it all over again, you know, in my late 20s, I actually had to feel for the first time emotions that I tried my whole life to run from. Yeah. So it was harder. It felt like for the first time I was being abused because actually the first time I numbed it. And so then now this time it was like, you can't help me. I'm actually physically going through yeah. like, Domestic violence it. myself yeah. is what it felt like. Yeah, it was terrifying, and honestly, I had to step away even from ministry. I resigned from my job. Um, I moved to Alaska for a season because I, I was so weary of looking over my shoulder. Mm. I moved in with a family that's like a family to me, and they just like loved me, yeah. you know. But I, it was it was hard because even in ministry, you have this people put this expectation on you or you have this expectation yourself. Like, well, what's your new project? Well, what are you working on? What and it was like, I'm just trying, trying to, to survive here. Survive. I'm just yeah. trying to stay in the faith here. Yeah, I'm trying to stay here. And unfortunately, that's not like really esteem. So I did try to, in my first book, No More Faking Fine, I talk about the value of rest and stepping away. And if you look at it, most of God's servants did go through a time uh, that was really challenging. Like David, for example, a lot of theologians think that Saul had a mental illness because mm. one moment he liked David and the next moment he wanted him killed. And so I really took a lot of comfort in the scriptures of like, well, God has plans for David. God loves David, but David's also living through stalking. Yeah. So maybe this isn't my sin causing this suffering. Which maybe you had probably just, thought at some oh, point yeah. or another. I, well, I, I was, my prayer was like, is there like, sin in my life that this Are you is trying happening? to bring something out? Yeah. 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 And I think the way I felt people looking at me too of like, Esther's not doing something. So something's got to be wrong. 
Did you find that it was hard? I mean, you said like you worked at this organization, they have all these marriage books and all these things, but not really any that you could relate to. Did you find it hard in Christian circles to express this pain? Because oh, very it is much. so uncommon. I mean, I know you're the second person I've ever met in my life, and I, I know that's not true, who has publicly talked about stalking. Yeah. And so, yeah. or I don't know a lot of people who've grown up in homes where the dad was in and out of jail. But my question is, how was it difficult talking with your friends about these things that they might not understand? Yeah. I think it's still difficult to share a lot of what I share. Do what because why? I think um I think most of us are uncomfortable with brokenness and or sometimes it can be the opposite and we can almost like idolize brokenness and right. like almost have that as an identity. I think there's few people that are talking out of a place of healing. Like I think sometimes we'll go through brokenness and we think like, okay, well, this is gonna be the next book. It's like, no, 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 I'm like just trying to survive here. Get on the other side. And I'm trying to get on the other side and I'm trying to stay in the faith. Um, I never wanted to write a book about this. I mean, I still struggle with my hardest stories being out there. I mean, it's difficult. Yeah. So yeah, I feel very misunderstood at times. I think I've seen where friends, I have certain friends that can really be great friends to me in a lament season. And they have a harder time celebrating like when I'm out of that. And then I have certain friends that love celebrating and I love them. But like when I start going through a hard season, they kind of back away. So um, I think one of the goals that I had with writing No More Faking Fine was like, just normalizing that our lives are not these formulas and that it ebbs and flows. And it, it we will go through lament seasons and we will go through celebrating and all of us have a place in God's story. And we need to be able to give people room to be in the season that they're in and celebrate them and not be like Job's friends and try to put a formula to get them out of it. So you said, knowing that your hardest stories are out there is hard and yet you wrote them. What was your hope for writing them? Because you knew that was going to be hard, yeah. right? I knew I felt so alone um, in my laments. Like I would pray when I was really afraid that my father was going to physically take my life. I I remember like laying in bed at night, I would lay on my Bible because I thought if something happens to me, at least people would know, like I tried. And I'm not a journaler. And like, I, especially when you know my past, like in my diary was right in the courtroom, I'm not about to like write my emotions down. But I thought like, I wanted my actions to show like I'm staying in the faith. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I remember feeling like, what if, what if there's a woman in the Middle East who's living through fear like this? And like, what could I say to encourage her? Like, what could I say? Like, if if maybe, you know, she grew up in a culture where women weren't validated and given a voice, and what if she came to Christ? And what if she was fearful of being killed for that? What would I say to her? And like, as much as I love Christian books and resources, like there was not really you a book find on the shelf yeah. that I could give to her. Yeah. And I thought that's my hope is that somebody would read this book and learn this language that's all throughout scripture, that they would go to scripture and see that their laments are heard by God and that He doesn't leave them in it and that He listens to them and that they would find a home in the scriptures like I did. Okay, guys, I'm breaking in real quick to thank our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Dave's Killer Bread. Hey guys, I'm asking you a question. Does your morning toast or bagel taste more like cardboard than bread? Then you have not tried America's number one organic bread, Dave's Killer Bread. Dave's Killer Bread is made with the highest quality organic and non-GMO ingredients, power packed with whole grains, fiber, protein, and killer taste and texture. It's not just good for you, it tastes better than everything else. Level up your bread game with Dave's Killer Bread, the best bread in the universe. You guys, when I saw Dave's Killer Bread was gonna help us sponsor the happy hour, I literally screamed out loud because I have been enjoying this bread 
for a long, long time. I love it toasted with like a runny egg on it and some avocado. My boys take Dave's Killer Bread in their lunches every day. We get the bagels. Seriously, guys, I love this bread so much. Visit daveskillerbread.com to learn more and look for Dave's Killer Bread in the bread aisle of your local grocery store. That's daveskillerbread.com. Today's show is brought to you by Rothy's. Comfort when traveling, comfort when running around town, or comfort when just being at home is high on my list of priorities. All of those things. That's why I love Rothy's. Their shoes are stylish and comfortable. I love that Rothy's is constantly launching new styles. You guys, seriously, if you find a style, you got to get it because it's going to be gone. So you're guaranteed to find a pair or two or three that you're going to love. You know what I do when they get dirty? I throw them in the washing machine. That is a life hack for you that Rothy's is giving us. Buy shoes you can wash. Rothy's are the perfect everyday shoes for life on the go. They're stylish and comfortable. They're also available in a range of styles like sneakers, loafers, points, and more. And because Rothy's are seamlessly knit using thread made from, yes, this is true, I'm about to say, plastic water bottles, they are ultra comfortable as soon as you slip them on. There's an added bonus is that Rothy's have diverted over 35 million water bottles from landfills already. Plus, Rothy's always comes with free shipping, free returns, and exchanges, so there's no risk, no worries, and no reason not to try. Check out all of the amazing styles available right now at rothys.com slash ivy. That's I-V-E-Y. That's my last name. Go to rothys, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash ivy to get your new favorite, comfortable, stylish, and sustainable shoes that you've been waiting for. Head to rothys.com slash ivy today. Onico 2087. Book your next getaway to the stunning white beaches of Riviera Maya and immerse yourself in a one-of-a-kind experience. Onoco 2087 Hotel Riviera Maya is the aspirational, adults-only, all-inclusive hotel situated south of Playa del Carmen. Discover and embrace contemporary Mexico face-to-face and share in a passion for the region defined by relaxed luxury and cultural immersion. Dining at Onico 2087 is a multi-sensory adventure. While locally sourced ingredients are a staple at every restaurant and bar, the offerings are a diverse mix of international flavors. The energy shifts as the evening darkens to night with live performances, late night snacks, and a -a one-of-a-kind programming. Exciting pop-up events, including cooking classes, mixology classes, salsa lessons, and so much more. I want to do the salsa lessons, you guys. Each of their three pools offers poolside food and drink service, as well as cabanas that can be booked in advance. They also offer personal training sessions, meditation and yoga, beachfront classes, and state-of-the-art gym. From select spa and beauty salon treatments to golf and excursions, your stay includes the amenities of a luxury hotel and more. Visit onicohotelrivieramaya.com or contact your preferred travel professional. Okay, back to the rest of my conversation with Esther. Well, it leads you to so beautifully to the next stuff that you penned down, um, which is your new name, which came out last month. Um, it seems like a very easy flow out of this whole lamenting Mm -hmm. and sharing your story and sharing what you've been through. Because I would imagine that working through, working through your book of No More Faking Fine, you're telling your story, you're doing that. This, I'm going to go out on a limb and say has been your life for a long time. The newness? New name. Yeah. Like, who does God say Esther is? Yes. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. And all of us are, I mean, we all have to go through that, you know, throughout our life multiple times. Who does God say I am? Who's the world saying that I am? What was interesting is that I kind of ended No More Faking Fine with, um, there is a scripture in the book of Psalms that says that God gives us a new song after a time of distress or after a time of despair. And that word new really stuck out to me. And actually, when you look at the word new in scripture, One of the definitions is not found like you were before. So we know that like we're new creations or we know that there's a new covenant. We know that God puts a new spirit in us. We know all these new things, but I was seeing this trend of like, there's new names all throughout scripture. Like not just in the Old Testament, God would physically change somebody's name and identity, but spiritually he would change people. And I thought, man, I am really wrestling with a lot of these old labels. And the only time label appears in the original language, it's like when you're called something. And like, thought, give me an example. Like you're called, you know, you're called a widow. Okay, got That's it, got it. That's now your label. Yeah. 
that's not your identity, but right. like all of a sudden you're called a widow or you're called single. Like, and you, you, you almost take that on as your identity. Well, for me, I was taking on this orphan label, which I actually was orphaned. So it did require a lament. Mm. Like every adoption is going to require a lament. There was a brokenness there, yeah. but that isn't God's destiny for humans is that we would stay orphaned. And so um, as I started studying scripture, I realized God always renames us. He is in the business of renaming us. And if it's not a physical name change, it, it is a spiritual name change. And it's never, he never renames somebody out of their past or out of their sin. He doesn't label somebody. He doesn't name call us. He names us out of love. He gives us prophetic names. He gives us names for what he's calling us into. It's the same way when you pick a name for a child, like you want this to be a life-giving name, you know? And that's how God names us. It's better than what we could have thought. And that's when I thought, okay, I'm coming through this season of lament. I need to be able to say goodbye to these old labels. And that doesn't mean sweep them under the rug, like a lot of us do. That means like identifying them, lamenting them, and then saying, God, I don't wanna live like an orphan anymore. Change my mindset and help me to believe I'm a daughter. Help me to, to know that you've called me chosen, that I'm not a mistake, that I actually am in your family, that I have an inheritance in you and help me to believe these names and to live out of them. So it sounds like one of the first steps we have to do is identify these labels. Yeah, it is. Which I think that's hard. It's so hard, but you know, God shows us with the story of Jacob. He says to Jacob, what is your name? Which is hysterical because God is all knowing. God knows what Jacob's name is, but God is saying to Jacob, where are you at? Hmm. Where are you at, Jacob? What is your name? Who are you? And God is gonna ask all of us that, where are you at? Like the world wants to identify you in this group or you're taught to identify this way. Like, where are you at? And it's to bring wherever we're at and whatever we've believed to God and ask, but is this who you say I am? Does this align with who you say that I am? That is so good. And I'm sitting here thinking, Sometimes I just don't want to think where I am. Right. Because I might be embarrassed or I might think, oh, this is gonna cause me so much work or yeah. am I dealing with this again or all of those things. But we have to identify them before we can bring them to the Lord. Yeah, we do. And I think, you know, I think that there needs to be more of a healthy emphasis on self-reflection in the Christian walk. I think a lot of us, we wanna just like move forward for God and go, go, go. And many times throughout scripture, God asks us to reflect and to, to say like, where are you at right yeah, now? Yeah. What's, what's going on? Okay, so what do you say to the person who's like, okay, I've identified my labels. Guys, where are you at? I've identified my labels. I'm, I want a new name. What does that actually look like practically to yeah. walk through that? So one thing I um, realized about myself is when I feel like God is showing me you know, something that he wants me to teach on, I'm always like looking for the formulas. And I, I, I don't know why, I just want a quick fix or something. Like I wanna know like, okay, what do I do? For to this. do this, like, uh -huh. how do I lament? What is it, you know, how do I come out of it? Whatever. And what I realized is that there's just way less formulas in scripture than what I want there to be. And so I looked at the different name changes in scripture and no two are alike. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I try to go through every chapter, like here's an example of a name change and here's how it might happen for you. Like Jacob, Okay, for let's example. go through one. Pick, yeah, who, pick Jacob, whoever you want. Jacob wrestled with God. And um, I think a lot of Christians really don't think they can wrestle with God. Oh, it's but not Jake, our place, right? Right, Yeah. right. Or we think like we don't have a high view of God if we wrestle with God. Oh, yeah. But Jacob wrestled with God and he was renamed in the middle of his wrestling. And so I wanna give the reader hope, like you might be wrestling with God about something and God might whisper to you your name in that. Like you don't have to be like through the other side of that and now leading a, a ministry to get your new name. Mm -hmm. It's it's not, God doesn't name us out of our achievements. We're even named his workmanship before we can ever do a thing for him. Yeah. So I, I try to highlight different examples. Another one is Sarai is renamed to Sarah and Abram is renamed to Abraham. Well, Abraham is called the father of nations. They had yet to bear any children. So how, I mean, they would have looked at their labels, like mm -hmm. we're childless. Childless and, and old. We are not going to be father yeah. of nations. Well, the nations are still in existence. Uh -huh. You know, it, the, the plan that God had for them was bigger than they could have imagined. And so for them, God was naming them for what he was calling them to. Um, so that's the thing. God is so creative that our new names are deeply personal. And I, I believe that some of them are in scripture. I, at the end of every chapter, actually, I, I talk through different labels that we have that, that hopefully people can relate to, like abandoned and alone and complicated. Um, and then I, I hope to identify new names that are in scripture, like you're alive, you're blessed, 
You're a follower. You're God's creation. You're an imitator of God. And what are these names that we can start living out of? Because I believe it changes how we live. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I was doing some um, volunteering in the county jail. And this, I'm thinking about your book and I'm like thinking how badly I need to get this mm. to my friends that still volunteer there. Um, but this is a big thing, labels for women who are in that situation that I was meant to incarcerated. Um, a lot of them coming from broken families, broken homes. And so they just had the hardest time, like we all do, but this is just a scenario I'm thinking about, of thinking about themselves as anything other than yeah. these labels. Yeah. And it was almost as though when you saw something go off in their eyes where they thought they could yeah. believe for a split second that they were chosen and loved yeah. and cared for in his workmanship, you saw this kind of, could this be true about me? Yes. God never names us out of our past. He never names us out of our failures, out of our sin. He wants us to identify those. He wants us to lament those things that have caused a broken relationship maybe with him or with others, but that's not how he names us. He names us forward. He calls us forward. And that's the hope that this Psalm brings when it says, I will give you a new song because God is going to do a new work inside of us. And we're going to sing a song that we couldn't have previously sung. So when I was being orphaned, when I was being abused, like I could not sing the song, You're a Good, Good Father, if it had come out then. Like that would have been a really difficult song for me to sing. But on the side of a new name, knowing that I'm God's daughter, I have a new song that I can sing and I couldn't have sung it before. But if you skip the process of mm. lament, you know what I mean? If you skip the like hard work of letting God into these places, you're not gonna have that new song. Like, So this is my question then. If I'm sitting here and I'm a listener and I'm thinking, I cannot do what she's saying. Like I cannot enter into God. Do you think they've missed the lamenting? Does yeah, that make sense what yeah, I'm saying? It does. And I, I do say, I think you can't fully forgive unless you lament. So you're saying this is a critical process. Yeah, it is. And it is like a one, two. Have you forgiven your parents? I, uh, yes, I have. I mean, over and over and over again. So I'm sure there's gonna be a memory that comes up again and I'm gonna have to choose forgiveness again. And in fact, I heard a, a Bible teacher share once that when we're told to forgive 70 times seven, it actually means the memory. Mm. It's not just like a physical, like we'll forgive this many times. Like we are going to have painful memories resurface you know, as women where we've been mistreated, where we've been forgotten. It's not like you just forgive your offender once and then move on. You might have to, for the rest of your life, choose forgiveness. So every time a memory comes up, yes, you're having to say, I'm gonna choose to forgive you for fill in the blank of what that yes. memory was. And I think that's, that's interesting because I think a lot of times we're taught forgive and move on. Right, which is not in the Bible. And really difficult as well. It's really difficult. And really the only times when it says, like the Lord will say, forget the former things, don't dwell in the past. He's referring to the Israelites being nagging because they would blame God for their problems. So God's saying to them, like, forget the former things that you're blaming me for, move forward. But we've taken that in different Christian circles to say, forget the past, think of lovely things, think past. of new things. And that's not what God calls us to. God wants those deep places of our heart and He wants to know where we were wounded and where strongholds have started. And He wants to heal those places. So the answer to the question is, Yes, by God's grace, He's helped me forgive. But also by God's grace, I need like more help to continue to forgive yeah. um, because some of my offenders are still living and, and they don't have good intentions towards me. Yeah, your dad has passed away, your biological father's passed away. Yes. Did you ever um, have face-to-face -face conversation about you forgiving him? I never did. Yeah. And some of the best advice that was that's okay, given to me right? is like, you don't need to go make amends yeah. with people. Like we're called to unconditionally forgive, but we're not called to unconditionally reconcile. Yeah. And when I was going through the stalking years, my father, cause I had restraining orders. So he would go to jail again. And I would have certain people say, well, you need to go meet with them and you need to go share this. And you need to, and like, the reality is that's just a very small view of God. If you think I'm the only resource that God has to, lead my father to repentance, you know. Um, I was called to unconditionally forgive, but reconciliation takes two. And you know what, Jamie, I I really struggled in those years, like feeling like I was a bad daughter, you know, and wanting, I wanted health for my father, but it wasn't until writing your new name, I was changing my son's diaper. 
And I was just like enamored with this baby that God gave me. I just had this like new chamber in my heart of love for him. And I started singing the Apostles' Creed out of like nowhere. I mean, I'm so sleep deprived, you know, like where do I singing this song from? And I had a memory come back of my father when I was young, wanting me to memorize the Apostles' Creed. And it was like, really caught me off guard. Like, I remember even having to like sit down after I changed his diaper, like, where, where is did that coming come from? Yeah. from? And I just asked God, like, what are you, like, what are you trying to show me here? And for like a minute, I just had a memory when my dad did try to be a good dad. Mm. And I realized that when I have a new name in God, I'm able to rename my offenders. And for years, my father had been violent and unpredictable and unstable, and he never paid child support, and there was so much pain. And I had all these labels for my father, many of them he deserved. Right. But when I went through that forgiveness process with him, which requires a lament, I realized like I can rename him. Like he doesn't have to have those that power over me anymore. And I can just say, I'm thankful that he taught me the Apostles' Creed. Hmm. I'm thankful that out of all the faith traditions, we were at least in a Christian church. Like, you know, I'm thankful that maybe at one time in his life, he was submitted to Christ. And I'm thankful that he might be in heaven because of that. Hmm. And I was renaming my offenders. And that's the thing, like even Joseph in the Bible, when he was cut off from his family line, he was like able to identify his brothers. I mean, he could have called them human traffickers because they were. And yet David or, or Joseph, sorry, he went aside and said he wept, he lamented first, and then he was able to not define them by their label, but he was able to acknowledge like, I'm your brother, you're mm. my brothers. And there's power in that. Yeah. So I think it is a one-two step. We forgive, we lament, and then hopefully by God's grace, we're able to rename those who have offended us. That's so beautiful. It's so, I've never thought about the renaming of those that have offended us because our self, our sinful heart says they don't deserve it. Right. Which, whole nother story, but. Exactly, and it might it might take, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like it was an easy process. For sure, I for mean, sure. And it's an ongoing process, yeah, yeah. you know, but, um, but I do think that that's when we know our new name, it allows us to see where God can also rename people who have done the worst things to us. Is it Lisa Turkhurst on here that she said, forgiveness is required, but reconciliation is not? Mm, I yeah. would agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so hearing your story and the way that God's moved in your heart and in your life and the way that you've been vulnerable with others through your story, knowing earlier what you told me about marriage, you said I had all these kind of ideas. Um, I think marriage is one of the most beautiful gifts that God has given us. Like it is my favorite thing in the world. I love my husband. Marriage is awesome. I had my own issues going in and you had yours. How has being married, what'd you say, three years? Yeah. How has that been coming from a childhood where you didn't see marriage the way that God intended it to be? Yeah, it's actually better than I thought it would be. Um, a lot of that though has to do with believing, you know, I, I felt like God actually wanted me to understand that I was a bride like even before I met my husband, I felt like the Lord said, you're going to be a good bride because you you already are a good bride. Mm. In that I love the church and I don't use the church. I serve the church and I want the best for the church. And I want to love the church unconditionally, even when it hurts me. Like, and that all those things are required in marriage. And so I felt like my single years were really critical um, for me to be able to enjoy the marriage that I'm in now. And it doesn't mean that it's like without hardship or yeah. without pain, but I really do see it as a gift. And it's actually been a, a huge catalyst for healing for me. Um, in fact, when I was writing your new name, I give examples of even sharing how my physical name change from Fleece to Allen happened and how letting go of that old name was harder than I thought. But God was asking me to embrace this new name and this new family. And I was so excited to write about how I met my husband and about our marriage and about our little boy. But I wanted to remember friends of mine that are not in that season or friends of mine that are in a hard marriage. Because mm -hmm. I understand that that's not a tool for healing in everyone's yeah, story. Yeah. But I'm thankful that it has been in mine. And um, it's, it's interesting because I felt like when I look back, the thing I feared the most was marriage and family because mm -hmm. I didn't want to repeat the cycle yeah. that I came from. Yeah. 
And they've actually been God's greatest gifts in my healing process. It's really beautiful. I hear there's a story about your wedding dress. Oh, oh it's a great story. I want to hear it. <laughs> well, you know, knowing a little bit of my background, I missed a lot of school dances because I couldn't afford to get a dress, you know, and or my hair and nails done. And my goodness, I mean, it's a lot of money, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> to do all these yeah. things. And um, and so when it came to like me getting engaged and stuff, I mean, I really hadn't thought about, I really never like dreamed up my wedding. I just didn't think I was gonna be married. So my sister came in town, my family came in town and they said, we're gonna go to Nima Marcus and we're gonna make an appointment for you to try on dresses. But they were like, don't get your hopes up. Like this is just for you to like try on beautiful fabrics. Like we're not gonna buy anything. You're not gonna buy anything because yeah. it's Nima. Yeah. You know? yeah. But like, but je- we want you to feel like you're a bride. And and um, so we go to Neiman's and there's all this commotion in the lobby and it ends up being this famous dress designer. I mean, she does dresses for Michelle Obama and Kendall Jenner. And I only know this because I was Googling in the dressing room. Okay. okay. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> like, Who is yeah, all this? Exactly. Yeah. So she comes to the door, knocks on the door and says, um, I can tell that you're the bride. And would you come and try a dress on? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You must think I'm someone else. Like, you know, I, like I just got done Googling her. Right. Like, her name's Ramona Cavisa. Okay. I thought there's no way she thinks I'm somebody else. I can't afford these dresses. So she, the first dress she has me try on is a dress made for a literal princess. It took them a year to make. This was like the first American like replicant of this dress. And you're trying these on for what reason? I don't even know. Okay, okay. Other than, <laughs> hey, I can't afford it, but I'm But I mean, to, why is she asking you to? She's doing a trunk show. She's just there. And people are watching. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Crazy. Uh-huh. I mean, but people that can actually afford the dress. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I didn't want to tell her, you know. <laughs> but like, we're just here to touch the fabric. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Let me just smell the fabric. Yeah. And um, so I try this dress on and like her attendants are pinning it in all the right places. And you have to realize like, I never saw myself as a bride. I never saw myself as beautiful. Like when your own parents don't want to stick around for you, you don't, you don't see a whole lot of value in yourself. And I turned the corner and I looked in this mirror and they had me step on this pedestal. And she walks over to me and says, this is God whispering to you, you're beautiful. The um, dress The dress maker? designer. Designer. Like what is happening? Like I, I felt like somebody had transported me to heaven. I mean, I've always loved fashion. Yeah. Like what in the world? Like, and now she's saying God is whispering to you, you're beautiful. So it was like almost too much to handle. I totally start crying, of course. I, you know, I lived in that moment and I thought this is one of the best moments of my right. entire life. And I go back to the dressing room and I'm like, back to the real world, right? You know, but like, it was such a beautiful moment for me. Well, a knock on the door comes again and she has another dress and she says, I made this one with you in mind. I'm thinking, she really does not. She's thinking I'm somebody else. Like we just met, you know? And she said, I want you to try on this dress. It's going to match your skin tone. So I undo this, the dress thing and it's a blush color, which it's like a pink off pink. Pink's my favorite color. And I tried this dress on and I go back out and they're pinning it and it's beautiful. And she was like, this is it, this is beautiful. And so we go back to the dressing room and this family who took me in in high school is there. It's who I call mom and dad, who I call my sister. And um, they said, we wanna buy this dress for you. The mom did? Yes. You, I couldn't believe it. You got the bl- the pink I blush, got the pink, pink dress. blush dress from the designer. So we go back out, we say, We'd like the dress. I mean, I couldn't even say it because I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And so my mom says, we're, we're going to get this dress for you. She goes out, tells them, we, this is the dress we want. And then all the attendants are like, wonderful. We're going to throw this in for you. We're going to throw this in for you. We're going to rush order. We're going to, because they hand make these beautiful oh gowns. And here God was not only saying, Esther, you're a beautiful bride, but I'm providing for you to be a bride. And I'm giving you everything you need. You don't have to afford it. You don't have to earn it. Like I'm going to gift you with a dress more beautiful than you could imagine. And that's how our new names are. Like they're better than we could expect for ourselves. And so um, I had a, a dress fit for a little princess. And, um, you know, I ended up sending this woman like a huge thank you. And I write about the the dress story in your new name and I'm going to send her the book. Because oh, I, I don't yes. know, I don't think she has any idea. I don't know if she's a Christian or not. Or I don't think she has any idea yeah. how God used her that day to make me feel seen in my new name. 
That's a beautiful story. Thank you. Where's your wedding dress today? It's in my closet. <laughs> okay. I actually would love to like frame it. You know yeah, how like they, uh-huh. you can frame uh-huh. dresses and stuff. And I, I do want to frame it, but it's just not cheap to frame. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. We'll work up to we'll that. We'll wait up for that. We'll <laughs> After we're that. done buying diapers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a beautiful story. Thank you. And it is a beautiful representation of how God sees us. And yeah, has and it's more not for like, us. it's not like we earn it. Like if no. I, if I tried to like pay them back for the dress, it would actually be insulting. And we try to do that with God. Like, well, I'm going to try to live right and act right and talk right. And it's like, God is interested in giving us new names that we don't even deserve and that are better than we could ask for or imagine because of His love for us. That is just how beautiful and how pure His love is for us. Can I ask you one more question? Yes. When we start to bring our labels, we lament. We see that God has something better for us. How do we continue to stand on those new names? That is such a great question because it's just like most of the Christian walk that we need constant reminders and we need friends to remind us. Like my husband reminds me that I'm his bride. You know, if my husband only said, I love you once and then that's it, it would be like, oh, I want to hear it again. You know, we need friends, we need community, we need reminders. And even though I wrote a book on what are our new names, like I need to be reminded who I really am because all of us will divert back to the the lies and the labels. And some of us have lived with them for decades. So it's hard to throw off. They don't just come off overnight. But the Christian walk is worth it to fight through who God wants us to become. God's worth it. And it says in the book of Revelation that to those who overcome, we will be given a new name and that we will know His new names. There's names that God has and beauty that God has that we can't even imagine right now that if we overcome and when we overcome, we get to know even more about God. Isn't that crazy? It's so exciting. So exciting. Um, Esther, I am so grateful for you to spend an hour with us today. Thank you for it's having me. It's been so beautiful. Um, I'm glad to know you. Same. Now. Same. And I cannot wait to find out this baby's name. Thank you. This baby's new name. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for sure. But in all honesty, um, I know, and you even alluded to how difficult it has been to kind of have these very raw and sensitive parts of your life be so public. And I don't think that that was an easy choice, but I do sense in you that your greater joy was, what if somebody else feels like I did? And how do I let them know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I couldn't do it if it weren't for friends like you that believe in me and help get the message out. You know, I just got an email from a woman who um, is in the hospital with her husband. I don't know her. I've never met her. She like wrote into my website and she said, you write in the book that you wrote this for others to stay in the faith. And we want you to know that our hus- my husband's dying, but we're staying in the faith because of these words. And it does, it makes it worth it. It doesn't make it easy, you know? Um, but I appreciate you helping me get the message out because I do want God to encourage people in whatever season they're in yeah. and that they're worth celebrating and they're also worth sitting with in their laments and God won't leave them in that forever. And there we go, friends. Esther Fleece Allen, thank you so much for thank coming you, on the Hour. Guys, I know you loved it. I loved it. Esther is someone who immediately felt like a friend after she was in my studio. And I left this conversation in awe of God's enduring love and never ending mercy towards us. As Esther says, God never names us out of our sin, but calls us forward. He names us based on our future. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Esther, for this reminder. And thank you for sharing your story with us. Guys, go grab Esther's book. It's called Your New Name, Saying Goodbye to the Labels That Limit. Today's show is edited by Chris with Podshaper and the music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Show notes are written by Aki Slockers and the whole thing is organized by Lindsay Sweeney. Next week on the Happy Hour, we have a new friend, Cheryl Luke, who I've been wanting to have on this show forever and ever and ever. She's joining me to talk about all things around freedom and reframing our thoughts to know what is true and not to live in what is a lie. Yes, how awesome is that? The conversation right after Esther's conversation today. You're not gonna wanna miss this, especially you guys. Cheryl flips a script and she asked me some questions as well. She couldn't help it. Also, don't forget on Fridays, we have your last decade, which I've heard so many good remarks about our last one about James. If you missed it, go listen to it. This week's guest for your last decade is someone who's been requested forever to be on the happy hour. And I just never actually gotten around to it. And I've never even met her. And now I love her, Erin Moon. I already loved her, but you know, I love her even more. Erin Moon, who is the COO of the Popcast Media Group and the resident scholar for the Bible Binge Podcast, joins us to talk about her journey these last 10 years with church. We have a lot of fun, of course. Guys, enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend. Have a happy hour with a friend. I'll see you on Friday, and then I'll see you next Wednesday. This is so much fun.